Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Dumbfounding Definitions, Dizzying Distinctions, and Diabolical Doctrines, a series sorting through some of the jargon of philosophy. In this video, we're going to be returning to the paradox of voting, also known as Down's Paradox. Now, four years ago, we covered Down's Paradox, also known as the Paradox of Voting. This is a paradox arguing that it is irrational to vote because the costs outweigh the benefits. The chance of your vote making a difference in an election is minuscule. Even if you knew that a particular candidate would provide you personally with a huge windfall, the likelihood of your vote being decisive is small enough that the costs of just taking the time out of your day to vote outweigh the benefits of the rare chance that your vote would make the difference. Check out our first video for a more explicit outlining of that argument. Now, in the last video, we looked at this paradox in depth, and we also looked at two objections to it, the mandate response and the expressive response. In this video, we're going to further explore the case for voting, given that the U.S. election is coming up very soon, with three more objections to the paradox of voting, the collective action objection, the coalition objection, and the local election objection. Let's take a look. So, a collective action problem is one where individuals acting together could achieve a better result, but each individual has a strong incentive to act against the interests of the group. Check out my video on the prisoner's dilemma for one example of this, but we'll look at a very classic example here. So the tragedy of the commons is an example of such a problem. Imagine a village green, a large grassy patch in the middle of an old-fashioned village for grazing your animals. If everyone grazes their animals as much as they want, the green will be eaten and destroyed and it'll be no use for anyone and the animals will eventually starve. But if everyone grazes their animals just a moderate amount, the green will be fine, it'll survive and it'll be able to sustain the animals and the population. If only one person in the whole village overgrazes their animal the green, on the green, it'll be fine because one animal or one family's set of animals isn't enough to kill the whole green. But if everyone overgraces their animals, the green will die. Everyone has an individual incentive to overgraze because just one person doing it would not lead to the green dying. But there's a collective incentive not to kill the green because of the negative consequences there, since that would lead to, and keeping the green alive would lead to better benefits for everyone. So the individual incentives are opposed to our collective incentives. Now, a similar issue exists with voting, and there's a strong case that voting is a collective action problem. While it may be a net cost for an individual to vote, it is a net benefit for society to have democratically elected leaders for all sorts of reasons from economic prosperity to generally more stability to getting your views represented by the government you have chosen, etc. If you want to argue that democracy is a bad thing, that's a separate topic that we can deal with in a different video. Collective action problems are often resolved by mandates. If we pass a law that you'll pay a penalty if you overgraze the village green, this takes away the perverse individual incentive to overgraze and achieves the collective goal of keeping the green alive. This is the case for passing laws which individuals don't have an incentive to obey on their own, but they have an incentive to vote for because if everyone obeys them, it'll be a better outcome for everyone. It's a collective good, but an individual harm. This is the case for either making voting mandatory in a country, as is done in some countries, or socially pressuring others to vote. While it may be a cost to an individual to vote, it's a benefit to society if everyone votes, or if more and more people vote. And therefore, society should take action to require it, either through laws or social pressure. Such action will make the individual benefits outweigh the costs. If you face a fine or social stigma for not voting, even a rationally self-interested person has a reason to go out and vote in the same way that a fine for overgrazing on the village green gives a rationally self-interested person a reason to graze their animals at a normal pace that'll keep the green alive. 
You might be concerned with this response for a number of reasons. First, you might think that people who don't vote are generally less informed about politics and the political process, and having everyone vote might actually lead to worse outcomes, since they might vote against their own interests or against the collective interest. Such an objection might be countered by a society with strong education systems and protection against disinformation and misinformation. Second, you might claim that until a society with mandatory voting exists, we will have an individual incentive not to vote, even if we also have an incentive to advocate for policies which pressure others to vote. In response, the proponent of the collective action objection might claim that even if you don't have an individual incentive to vote right now because those policies are not in place, you do have some level of moral duty to do so because it's a good for everyone in the same way that overgrazing your green is morally wrong even if we don't have a law against it yet. Even if you're the only one that is doing it and your action alone doesn't create harm, we might think there's a moral imperative not to because if everyone did it, it would cause problems, a la a categorical imperative. Even if such a moral responsibility is not encoded into law yet, it may still exist if your individual actions could lead to collective harm. The second argument for voting is based around coalitions. So politicians build coalitions of demographic groups with similar views to gain support. They change policies to fit the views of these groups. The more voters a group has, the more parties and politicians will want to court them and shift their platform to better fit the wishes of those voters. Note that this isn't citizens, this is voters. If a particular demographic group votes less than the general population, they may find their views underrepresented in politics because politicians know that they do not vote and so believe that those individuals will not, are not worth their time. The argument here is that even if your vote does not determine an election, you can influence policy by showing that your ideological group votes enough for candidates to alter their platforms to fit your views. Since candidates care about what percent of a group votes, every vote from a group counts because that increases your percentage even if you don't end up determining an election. If your percentage ticks up above another demographic groups and your ideologies are different or dissimilar, a politician may be more likely to pick your group over theirs. And this is particularly important for demographic groups that are traditionally underrepresented in politics or who traditionally have low voting patterns because every single one of them that votes will have a bigger impact and it may change the narrative that that group doesn't vote. For a clear example of this, let's take a look at religion. So, such a dynamic can be seen between evangelical and non-religious voters in America. According to Pew, evangelical Christians and unaffiliated voters make up about the same proportion of the U.S. population, about 25% for evangelicals and about 23% for unaffiliated voters. Why then do politicians in America often pander to evangelicals when they hold minority viewpoints, such as opposition to gay marriage or opposition to abortion, but not unaffiliated voters, despite them holding a similar portion of the population? Some of this is likely due to deeply negative perceptions of the non-religious among Americans, but some may have to do with the fact that evangelical Americans turn out to the polls at twice the rate of unaffiliated Americans, according to Secular America Votes. If you are non-religious, this may give you an incentive to vote if only to increase the share of the voting populace made up of people like you, and therefore increase the power of your ideas in party platforms. Your vote may never make the difference between a politician winning or losing, but the more that your demographic group can gain power and can gain representation, the more likely a politician may be to change their mind or to promote specific policies that you like because they want to keep your vote. If you don't vote, the politician doesn't have any reason to pander to you or to work towards your ideologies. The third argument here in favor of voting is around local elections. There are two features of local elections which make them less impacted by the voting paradox. One, they have a larger impact on your day-to-day -day life, and two, they're more likely to be decided by a small margin. Many are also nonpartisan, so even those who are disenchanted with political parties may feel represented in these elections. 
Local elections are more likely to be decided by a single vote simply because there are fewer people voting. A 1994 state house race in Wyoming, as well as city and county council elections in Nevada in 2002 and 2011 were actually tied. In those races, even one more post person voting would have made the entire difference of the election. And any individual that voted, if they had have made a different decision to vote or not vote, they would have been the deciding vote. It is highly unlikely that such a result would happen in a presidential contest, say. But for even more local races than a state house race, like school boards, or sheriffs, or judges, or district attorneys, this is quite possible and has happened not completely infrequently. And while when you go to vote, you may not have that much of a chance to influence a presidential election, most of the offices you're voting for on that sheet are local offices. It's not as if you're casting a single vote. You're casting many votes and many decisions between many of those contests that are going down on the ballot. And so once again, you're increasing the chances that your vote is going to matter. Not only do local races have a smaller margin, but they also can have a larger impact on your day-to-day -day life. Your life may not be impacted by federal policies, or either of the candidates might enact similar policies, at least in terms of their effect on your day-to-day -day life. But how the local schools are run will impact you if you have children in the school system. If you ever find yourself on the receiving end of a speeding ticket or an arrest warrant, you may realize just how much power the local judge or district attorney really has. This is not to say that your vote will have an impact on these elections, or that they will impact your life. Just that the calculation that we talked about in the last video is much different for these elections than state or federal elections because the margins are smaller, and because they're likely to have a bigger impact on your life, and because you're voting in more of those contests when you go for one day to vote, you're bearing the same amount of cost, but you still may be getting a chance to vote in 10 elections, as opposed to just one federal presidential election. Once again, increasing the chances that your vote will make a difference in at least one of those contests. As a skeptic, I don't know if it's right to vote, I don't know if it's rational to vote, but I am doing it anyway, and I hope that you do too. For my endorsement in the U.S. presidential election this year, check out my series on how skeptics vote. Go ahead and subscribe. Hit the notification bell if you like this content and you want to see more like it. Watch this video and more here at carnadies.org and stay skeptical, everybody.